Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Feeding Curiosity. I'm your host, Eric Wenzel, as always. For those who are unfamiliar, Feeding Curiosity is all about having conversations for others to live better. And it's through these conversations we can have blueprints for everyone from either habits, routines, or books and mentors that others can take away little nuggets for you to apply in your own life. In today's episode, I am joined by Matt Vincent. Matt is a strength athlete, a two-time Highland Games world champion, the founder of Hate Brand Goods, but is now rebranded to Not Dead Yet. Through his travels, Matt was lucky enough to spend time with the people who were chasing strength, fulfillment, and personal growth in every imaginable way. You can find Matt's first book, Training Lab. He spelled out the philosophy of the hate and tried to capture the spirit of self-improvement through self-loathing. This idea would serve the spark that led to hate brand goods and a ton of adventures afterwards. Matt chronicles his travels and conversations with people in the strength game and beyond on his podcast, now rebranded Not Dead Yet. We cover a lot of ground on how to aim yourself at what you find important in your life, not what other people tell you to do, but what you want to do with your life. Matt has evolved many times in his life and continues to evolve. You can expect to learn more about the risk of clinging to your identity or group of friends, why routine is a trap for stagnation and speeding up how fast your life passes by, the trap of expectations either you put on yourself or what you, your society and culture projects on you, and much, much more. You can connect with Matt on Instagram, YouTube, and his website, and I'll have links in the show notes for all of those things. But overall, this conversation was incredibly wide ranging and a ton of fun for me. Without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Matt Vincent. All right. Today I'm joined with Matthew Vincent. Awesome to have you on the show, man. I really appreciate you being here. Dude, happy to be here, man. It's awesome. So, I mean, you are a man of many hats. So before we dive into what you currently do, what did you do before you became, I mean, really it's like power lifter, then, I mean, pro clothing designer, and then now you're doing podcasting and other branding, like life advice type stuff. So where did this story start for you? So started really from where it would get exciting, right, is I ended up pursuing some power lifting after, um, kind of getting into my mid twenties. Like I just needed a thing again after being a collegiate athlete doing track and field at LSU, uh, that time ended and figuring out what to do with my life afterwards. Like anyone else, I went into work. I started a bike shop, I went into entrepreneurship right out of the gate and failed miserably. Um, after tucking my tail after three or four years and getting back into the swing of things, I, uh, had removed myself a lot from training and work. Um, training and throwing just because I, I, it had ended and I didn't, I never really understood going to the gym for the sake of health, if that mm. makes any sense. Um, yeah. And so a few years later, I'd found myself getting back into some strong man after I'd gone into a more standard job of, uh, working in the petrochemical industry as kind of a laborer. And through that time, I'd got back into strongman and got into some powerlifting. It was competing in both. And then things continued to improve with career wise um, till I found myself uh, competing in the Scottish Highland Games. Uh, so I spent 10 years from like 2008 or eight years, 2008 to 2016, competing in the Scottish Highland Games. I won two world championships. And then. Um, in 2016, my knee started going bad. So I went in to do some elective knee surgery to clean it up with an ACL replacement. And uh, that didn't go well. And so my sport quickly came to an end. And um, I had nine knee surgeries over about a three year period. You know, five ACLs, a high tibial osteotomy, a OATS procedure, and then finally total knee replacement at 36. Wow. Um, and that was a really scary, dark time, man, um, which I'm sure we'll dive into. But that's kind of where the story starts, right, would be with me getting into the Highland Games. And that's mm -hmm. where I built a following doing those type of things. Um, and after that transition ended, I really leaned completely into continuing to grow the brand I had built, which mm -hmm. started during that window as I was writing a lot 
I had started a blog okay. back in 2008 talking about my training and writing, and then I was videoing my throws and putting that on YouTube. And at some point it kept growing to where now I'm vlogging and getting more into editing and learning this other parts and started writing. And I had a mentor at that point, uh, Jim Windler had, you know, convinced me more or less to write a book on training for the Highland games. And okay. so I did. Uh, one of the things I talked about it was the hate and had enough people at that point asking me to put some shirts out and had another great friend of mine, Phil, convince me that we could do the shirts thing without it eating up all of my life, um, which has not stayed true uh, <laughs> as, it's, as it's continued to grow, but it, it's been great. And so we figured that out because I still had a regular career. I, yeah. I was working in the oil and gas industries. I had a job that was paying, you know, almost 200 grand and was traveling for work and getting to compete and do all this. And then it ended really abruptly. So going off with, you know, kind of like your first stage of life up until 36 with, you know, having the ACL tears and that kind of stuff. It's, it sounds like, honestly, you, you kind of followed the path in some sense, like what life laid out for you. Go to school, get the good job, make the bunch of money. And then you kind of were like, well, is there more than making the money, so to speak? So you try to do this Highland Games thing, which I think is an interesting idea because like, that's like powerlifting, right? Like World's Strongest Man related. It's not exactly that, but. It's, 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 it's a niche of a strength sport, right? Like yeah. so it's all throwing based, which since okay. I had that background from college uh, is uh, great. And so it's a, it's a little bit different of a puzzle to solve as a strength athlete than say just weightlifting or powerlifting or strongman where. You know, all three of those are so focused on max effort that, you know, in all three of those sports, the better you get, the heavier things. In the Highland Games, the implements haven't changed for 700 years. And so it becomes how far can you throw this same thing that everyone's tried so to throw. So it's like skill-based strength in some yes. sense. <laughs> yeah. Full athletic endeavor of like, I'm trying to apply force to a sub-maximal object. Yeah. That's really interesting. Just, I mean, it's not a to, not only big that, different problem to solve. Yeah, but not only that, but like bringing that to the online world because I'm sure there's probably I don't even know ten people that there's have dozens enough. of us. Yeah, like there's not <laughs> not many people that have the knowledge, and then not many people who are on the internet with that knowledge to be able to share it, or even just applying lessons to it. Because, I mean, I'm really big into just functional fitness categorically, so the idea of picking up big and heavy things is just not a reality for me. Sure. But I was, I became interested in engineering and then by extension, like robotics. And then I found guys who were like talking about weightlifting in the like scientific way. And I was like, wait, I can take this as a science and basically do biomechanics and turn it into something that makes it accessible to me it, rather than just being like, pick up a heavy thing and do it a whole bunch of times. And that's what you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it becomes a different pursuit, right? Like I really enjoyed chasing max strength. In the, yeah. in the window, I did it um, just because yeah, I wanted to find out, right? Like, I mean, yeah. after years of now looking back at like what the awareness was of what I loved about competing now that I can't, mm -hmm. right? So like being able to break down that sport, because if I simply say like, well, I'm not happy unless I can do the Highland Games, right? I'm in a real troublesome spot because I can't do the Highland Games anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I can't even go be bad at it. Like my knee's just not going to do that anymore. Right, um, because you're just going to add more, more risk than reward over time. Correct, correct, right. And and I'm not personally turned on by trying to figure out the metric of how far I can throw now, older, and hurt. Makes I don't sense. care <laughs> what my squat max would currently be anymore, but I understand that having strength is important, right? I understand what options being strong gives me. Um, and so now getting to look at it differently, like I found out all my max effort metrics, I'll never be stronger than I was during the window when I found all those things out. So cool. Like if my record board of life <laughs> is up on the wall, like I got it, I, I got to see the best high school football player I can be. And now that chapter's closed. I'm not trying to continue to pursue that in my twenties. Mm -hmm. I got to see the level of track athlete I could be while I was in college. And then that door shuts because well, college is over and I wasn't going to the Olympics. And then, I think that's a really, you're like touching on a really important point where people tend to live in their past. Like they, they try to cling to that past version or vision of themselves and they can't 
step away from it or shed it in some sense and like be be able to grow into the next version of who they want like what do they want to aim for i guess even though yeah they- it's, it's it's really tough to shed that identity including me man yeah i i i really thought i had my head wrapped around it because even the whole time i competed i there's something i always called um you know being in on the joke and being in on the joke for me was whether it was powerlifting or whether it was weight training, you know, any of those type of things that like I already, because I have spare time to chase something as silly as figuring out how absolutely strong I can get, that already means my life's pretty great, right? Like I don't have to go hunt food tonight or chop wood to build a fire to not die. And yeah. so like I'm doing fake work to build muscles I don't need for the help of survival. So it's already a cool piece. And so I remember being in on the joke of like, you know, no, nope, it doesn't matter how far I throw this rock today. Like it's not gonna land on the great things that have ever taken place in human history. So it removes a little bit of that weight, yeah. which means it's only important to me. So I'm not doing it for some outside validation. I don't want to walk around trying to remind people that I was a world champion. You know, I love the fact that whenever you said the things that had got me here wasn't Highland Games and didn't bring it up. <laughs> Fucking great. That means this is all going according to plan. <laughs> that I'm doing something cooler now than continuing to have to talk about a thing I got done doing in 2016. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't you be a, like a little annoyed that you have to keep talking about the thing you did? Like the first thing you did in, in, in that was notable in your life? Like whatever. Me personally, yeah. I, I don't see th- that across the board for people, right? And I don't want to yeah. judge that if that's been a good thing for you. My personal take on the people who I've met that live, you know, in some obligation to their former ghost, it's really unfulfilling and you have to end up becoming a character. Yeah, that's, and that's a very good point. not what I wanted to do. And so yeah. as that changed, it was time to figure out like what else I was capable of doing. Mm -hmm. The identity of being a Highland Games world champion wasn't the hard one to shed. It was getting hurt and ending up in critical and chronic pain due to surgery Uh, and everything else. Yeah. That I had never, ever thought once that I wouldn't be athletic. Did you have like any injuries in like college and stuff like that? Was that like a common thing for you or was it like the major injury just totally random? I don't remember there being a bunch. I tore an ACL in college, got it fixed. And then I threw a PR like 91 days later. (laughs) And so like, you know, injuries happen. Like that's, that's, that comes with the territory, right? Like if you want to be safe, sit on the fucking couch. Also, that'll kill you too. (laughs) It's just whichever one you want to do. We're all all marching slowly toward death anyways. (laughs) Well, that, that's part of this new line that we've got with not dead yet and the rebrand and everything. This new, new drop, what we have is find what you love and let it kill you. Because all things are going to kill you fast and slow and better to die doing what you love. Yeah. Life is a terminal illness. That's one of the quotes I heard recently. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate zero, <laughs> you know? And so I embrace that because what that meant to me was that there isn't anything that's inherently valuable in it. So that means if it's not inherently valuable that other people are going to say, oh my gosh, look at this then I have to choose all the things that are important and they only have to be really important to me. Yeah. The audience of one. Yeah. Like, did you ever expect like the writing part of this too? Like, cause you said you were starting to write and stuff along with the athletics. Like, was that a thing you wanted to do too? Like, I feel like there's like a lot of pieces that are bubbling all around the same time. Yeah, right. There there was (laughs) a lot of interesting going on. And part of that is, is at that time, um, people were selling a lot of eBooks. So. During 2008, 2009, kind of beginning the fitness industry as that started, like ebooks were the way to go. And so I I put out an ebook and then I put out two more ebooks the next two years. After, of course, the the repetition before putting out a book was I had written a you know a daily or weekly blog about traveling for the Highland Games and what training looked like and all this other stuff at um driftalifta.com. And I was getting to share this piece, and then that became I wrote a book. And then I needed a place to sell the book. So then that turned into mattvincent.net. Got enough people ask about this concept in the book called The Hate, which was like my own personal motivation of going forward that I just won't tolerate mediocrity for myself. Mm -hmm. That if there's always room to improve, I'm going to go for it. That I hate 
that idea within me that good enough was acceptable. Yeah. And so as that resonated with people, we started the brand. And as the brands continued to grow and change over the last nine years, um, that message stayed true. And so that kept me wow. writing and it kept me writing, which is then now the more I've written, the better I am at saying things. Right. And so 300 podcasts later, <laughs> I'm pretty good now at, at, at speaking. <laughs> Funny uh, plus, how that works out. <laughs> yeah. Plus 10 years of being an outside sales rep. Like I'm not yeah. an introvert by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. And so it gave me this great outlet um, to continue to push myself into another direction. And that's cool. It, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's interesting just to see like how, it, you know, all these little tiny seeds that were planted and then you kind of just put it out there and gets a response and then it just grows and you just kind of keep, you know, I mean, saying yes to those things. And then by the time, you know, you look back on it, you're like, wow, that really was more important than I thought it was going to be. And it, it's just interesting to think to me, cause like I do podcasts because I, like I love talking to people, but I'm not an in extrovert by nature, like big mm. groups. I can't do it. Like I'll have to like walk away or like more than four or five people. I'm kind of like, I'll just sit quietly and listen. Um, but with podcasts, I, it was, became like this medium for me where I can go deep with people and like have more meaningful conversations about like the 20 questions you don't really get to ask people you've yeah. never, never met before. <laughs> and I like, that's really helps me. And I, I actually do sales and engineering now. So, and part of the reason I did that, and I think you'll probably find this funny, but I, because of doing this podcast, I was like, well, I'm going to go jump into sales because if I want to do entrepreneurial things, well, let me get paid to learn the skills to be a salesperson mm -hmm. and how business works. And then also become a technical person who can actually talk about the things to people. And then I have an advantage because I know how engineers think so I can talk their language without, you know, the disconnect, right? Like the disconnect, I think is one of the reasons why problems exist in almost any organization. Um, or interfacing with people, right? Um, and so it's just interesting to hear your story of like how you've kind of taken all the lessons and it's just kind of like refining them down to this point where you're at today. And you're just like, yeah, here's here's the message. Here's what we aim for. Like, since you're not using hate anymore as like your core brand, how do you wrap that into like the current version with Not Dead Yet? So hate for me was always how I got things done. Uh, right. Because how I got things done was knowing that I could do better and that this is something I'm interested in. And so that means I'm accountable to solve those problems if I really want to accomplish it. That's what, you know, the difference with Highland Games compared to the other strength sports, again, was that there aren't gyms for this. There wasn't training groups for this, you know, especially in Baton Rouge, yeah. uh, where I was living at the time. And so, you know, myself and probably other 20 guys in the world who were really good at it in the professional class, we all trained by ourselves in a garage five days a week. And then we all threw by ourselves in a field somewhere, you know what I mean? And so I didn't need any external motivation to do it. I loved it. I, I loved it. being able to apply that to the rest of my life. I didn't figure out until later of like, what was the gold if I boil that down that made me successful? Did you have to do that because of the injury you had? Like yeah. you finally extracted those yep, things through, of like- Starting to dig into more awareness because like, like you said, starting this off, right? Like I had followed a bit of what I believed was the expected path. You know, that Society's what I had- rules. <laughs> sure, right, right. Or whoever's rules. Yeah. You know, that- that I had followed what I believed was going to bring me happiness and fulfillment and comfort and the ability to put my feet up and live the American dream. And at some point I had to realize that that American dream isn't my dream. You know, that my dream was more exciting than that, that I wanted to live something bigger, that I had spent so much time focused on making this successful living, but I wasn't living a life. You know, I wasn't living my life the way I wanted it to turn out. And if I longer that I sit waiting for this vague answer to find me, if I keep doing the thing that isn't fulfilling me, it's never going to show up. And luckily for me at the time, like I had work and it was great, 
and I was good at it. And I had the Highland games. So like both boxes were checked. And then when the Highland games went away, the drive of passion left. Okay. I wasn't passionate about being an outside sales rep. Right. What I loved about being an outside sales rep is I had free time and I made good money. But I didn't know what to do to fill that other gap. And so it wasn't until I, things had got really bad. And then eventually I lost that outside sales job in 2017. Mm. And I leaned completely into the brand and deciding that if I've got this thing and it's got some legs, then let me give it 100% of my effort and see what it can do. Yeah. Like you finally said, okay, well, it's now or never. Like, well, they fired me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah they, they fired me. Uh, and, and rightly so. Um, I wasn't into it. So right. I, was, I was doing enough. Right. And doing enough is not going to get anyone anywhere. No, especially not um, in the sales world where you are expected to hit yep. your goals and then some. <laughs> right. And, and so switching that, that goal and switching that look to now, well, what's next? Because all I could see in front of me, man, was, was normal and average. And I could just see doors continuing to close. Mm -hmm. And I was really scared. And I got really dark. And then within the injury, not being able to move around and not do a lot of the things that brought me oh, joy, yeah. uh, I struggled. Like the, the, I didn't realize how much I used the gym time to eliminate stress. I didn't realize how much I needed that time in the gym by myself or out in the field by myself that helped my mindset. You know, while I love throwing, I didn't understand at the time that the great part I was getting was this time outside for 90 minutes, four days a week in the sun. All, all the vitamin D from the sun and just right, being in right. nature probably helped too. Ah, like, to oh, let's start breaking this thing down to what we really love about it. And then how do we apply that? Yeah. To the other things we want to accomplish. These little tiny things, that, like the, the things that are constants baked into your habits and routines that end up having an outsized impact, right? And not to mention in the other aspect of that, where you lose your job, you also can't move. So you are basically in a stasis and you're almost like a prisoner in your own mind of like, well, what's the next step? Because, you know, I think about this a lot, especially after going through the pandemic and things like that. It's like, yeah, you could go get a new job, but if you've done a certain type of job for five, 10 years, you can go get another one, but almost all companies are kind of the same. And it's like, okay, you could sacrifice yourself for someone else. Or you could, and if that's cool, or you find a thing that's comfortable, or you could do your own thing, whatever that looks like for you, um, or at least have like an outlet for it. Because I think it's, people will always, at least in the entrepreneurial space, always think about like hustling super hard and then like it has to make you money or something. But like you, you found it like early on with the Highland Games of like, you could work a really good job and then you had your outlet with the Highland Games. And I think that was like, a, that's a smart way to do it. Like, I think that works for a lot of people, but it's like hard to find it because people think it's like your extracurriculars are quote unquote wastes of time. And I think it's such a, like, a shooting yourself in the foot for like enjoying the things you really like in your life. Well, but that waste of time, right? Like who's defining that? We're already back to the <laughs> expectations and dealing with what other people think instead of being right. true to what <laughs> my, my thing is. But it didn't really boil down until I was able to look deeper at the awareness of that. Because everything yeah. you're saying, right, of like you can find another job, you can find another place to work. You still return back to you. Because once that comfort sets back in that we're back in routine, we're back in everything else, well, I'm still the one there. Right. And if that the guy constant. is genuinely not stoked and unhappy and lost and feels like this thing is just eating his life, it doesn't matter what the job is. Yeah. I'm still there. I'm still the one living it. And so until I started figuring out how to improve that baseline level of happiness and joy, that it didn't matter what the job was. It didn't right. matter what the extracurricular was because I fell in love with loving the project or, or figuring out progress. And the more that I figured out chasing progress, the better it got. 
because then that starts letting me remove expectations. It starts letting me remove this outside influence about where this is supposed to go and like, what's my plan? Right. I don't have one. My plan is to get better at this. Mm. That's it. I want to continue to get better and improve on it in the same way that I can look at throws and say, ah, fuck, I need to turn my right foot a little bit more. I need to be a little bit more aggressive out of the back or I can finish stronger. Look, I'm off balance. I need to have that same non-judgmental, objectional view of the other things I'm doing yeah, to be able to continue to push those forward. Of saying, yeah, but I've seen other people start a business and they've done great. Or I've seen other people start a business and they're grew faster than mine. Who gives a shit? Right. You know, they're, they're based on yours. Like none of those other rules apply to you. Everyone's on their own path and has so many different variables that aren't your life. Yeah. And, and look, man, I'm here to say it, right? Like my podcast has done well. I'm not rich. My apparel brand has done well. I'm not rich as far as whatever metrics we want to measure rich by. Like, right. I'm sure that there are people out there who see my life and think that's fucking rich, which by whatever metric, you know, personally, I don't because I know crazy fucking rich people now. <laughs> However, my life is rich because I'm in pursuit of what I give a fuck about. And that doesn't mean you need to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't mean you need to be any of that, but you need to know what brings you joy, what brings you enthusiasm. And then that lets us point the compass toward a thing. Yeah. And the simpler you can break that down. And for me, it just being progress, then I'm always in it. There's always room for me to chase that fire. It's not built on like, well, it didn't get to this metric. That shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, I mean, that's the problem with like a lot of the systems nowadays. It's all aggregated down to views and attention. And like, that's not useful because it doesn't tell you how people are actually responding to it or like people, um, like how they actually internalize it or the type of person you're hoping resonates with whatever the thing you're doing. Uh, and I like, even I think just with like well, how you're talking, it, it really does make a lot of sense to me because like, you're here for, I mean, it's a short time, but it feels like a long time, I guess is probably the best mm. way. To <laughs> but like, uh, how old are you? I'm th almost 30 and like, almost 30. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it will only continue to go faster. Right. <laughs> um, and the more that I found myself in mundane routine, the faster it went. Yes. And the more out of control I felt, the more lost I felt because I wasn't doing anything new. I didn't have new experiences. Like the first time I really recognized that feeling would have been in my, you know, probably mid twenties mm -hmm. up to that point. Like I had bounced in bars and I had tour managed for a friend's band and I had done the outside sales thing uh, or was really just getting started in the outside sales thing by that point. And I realized at some point that the people I'm around, like we didn't have new stories. Like no one had a new thing to say. We were just talking about all the shit that had happened. No one was talking about what they were going to do. It was already what we had done. And that terrified me. It terrified me that the idea that the most exciting part of my life was already over and I had to do something about it. And so I punched out of being around that group of people and it's alienating. Because yeah. they don't get it. They don't understand. And people take it offensively because it's about them and you think you're better or any of this other shit. And that's such a young man's ego thing to deal with. And then as that's continued, I've had to continue let going of the things that don't serve me going forward anymore. Always I have to keep that. Always have to be able to look at the things in my life and say, is this helping or is this not? And if it's not, let's decide whether or not we want to keep it. Yeah. I think it's really hard for a lot of people though, just being able to let go or even like letting go of your friend group, either if they're from college or their work friends or whatever you want to call them, deal friends is what I've recently heard a lot of those work type people are being called. And, and you know, it's like you, you're trying to take, you think they're your friends because you, you know, hang out with them all the time at work. But if you actually stop working there, the odds are you probably wouldn't be interfacing with that person very yep. much. That's, that's um, how it goes. Yeah, it's just reality, right? It's just, you're this, I really think too, it's like you're a, the, the adage of your product of the five people you're associate most closely with is like a huge, huge thing. 
because you take on their behaviors, even not knowing it, right? It's like the air you breathe in some sense is like the behaviors you take in from other people. And like, if you really want to make a positive change in your own behaviors, it's like, you might need to just drop people. Like, and that's not selfish. I mean, it kind of is selfish, but it's like, if you really want to be something different than what you already are, you got to be honest, like legit, like it doesn't mean you got to drop them completely, but if there's certain things that you know that if you do around them, you maybe don't go to those types of environments with those people. Yeah, that's you know. setting your own boundaries, which is another critical component of making progress. Is for one, being able to know yourself enough to say like, I can't do that. Like I can't, I can't continue to do that anymore. And being confident enough to not get overwhelmed by that idea that I'm letting those people down because I'm focused on my dream. And in the same way as I wanted to get stronger and get throw further or do any of these other things, right? I found gyms full of people stronger than me. That's not any different than the rest of your life. Like that, those people have a gravity. And if that gravity is operating at a lower frequency than where you want to be, it will pull you toward it. But if you're operating with a group of people that are a higher frequency than what you're dealing with, that gravity will pull you that way too. It gets tricky for people to find that, right? Like one of those things that people have a really hard time doing is the choice of editing their life, right? So like high school football ends, high school sports end, you lose a lot of friendships at the end of high school because something else in your life came through and said, this time's over. Yeah. Disperse, right? And then you go to work and you find a new set of people. And then you move on to college and you find this new set of people. And then when college ends, it's another time of like, well, this time's over. Everyone's going to be an adult. Disperse. <laughs> but it's really rare to find people who make that choice. Who say this time's over. Disperse. Yeah. You're Instead absolutely of right continuing to drag that identity with them of I was an all-state high school football player. I was a division one athlete. I was a Highland game world champion. I'm not concerned anymore with what I was and, and trying to hold some obligation to that former ghost of myself, but move toward who I want to be. Yeah. But if you don't know who you want to be, then it's really hard to figure out where to put that energy and direction. Uh, one of the things that like hit me early on, so I had to take a year off of school after call or after high school. So I didn't have, you know, parents didn't have a fund for me to go pick a college that I could go for. I didn't really do super, super well on the ACTs and stuff like that. So just like, well, pragmatically speaking, I have to go to community college, but I also have to work to pay for that. And so I worked at Walmart for almost three years mm -hmm. and that was like a huge awakening for me because and it's, it's kind of a weird juxtaposition because no one ever talks about it, but it's like you go from having a peer group that's somewhat like plus or minus four-ish years of your age group in high school, and you kind of look around and be like, okay, well, everyone's kind of sorted out, and it's like, these are the people where they're at in the current hierarchy, and it's like, well, they're just going to always be those kinds of people forever in your head as an 18-year-old or 17-year-old. And then I leave that environment at like 19, I go to work for the f first time, and now I have a peer group that's like, People are my parents' age or people that are, you know, plus or minus 20 years around me now. And I'm the youngest person in the room, likely. And then very quickly, I'm like, oh my God, this is what happens. People don't really have a plan for like, it's not even a plan per se, but it's more of like a feeling of like pointing the direction of their life in, in like an agency standpoint of like, this is what I hope to achieve with my life. And I'm going to make sure that nobody else can deviate that. Because if I wanted to, Walmart would have become this soul-sucking thing and been like, well, you're above average intelligence and you could become a manager and make a dollar more. And then you become an assistant manager and make like a little bit more than that. But you're just taking There's on- the trap. Right. And I just felt this like gravity well starting to like open up beneath me. And I was like, oh my God, if I don't think about what I want from my life, I'm going to be 35, 40 years old and got sucked into this thing that I didn't really want. You know, there's nothing that scares me more. <laughs> there's nothing that scared me more than my story being the one of I was 20 and then all of a sudden I'm 60 and I don't know what happened. Yeah. And look, think, I think what happens there, right, is because we switch off. 
And what I mean by switch off, like with our brain, is that we become in routine because we're such creatures of it. Oh, yeah. And we will try to follow the path of least resistance unless someone gives a shit, unless there's a conscious effort. As a species, survival was so important for so long that the idea of being comfortable was the, I, is the perfect way to go. And as we've been in our lives and you continuing to grow up, right, that like our where we're at on Maslow's hierarchy of needs has continued to rise. And now as we're in a spot where my food is taken care of, my warmth is taken care of, my house is taken care of, right? The three big things of food, shelter, water, whatever it is. Then we start getting into self-actualization. And that's a really tough one to start looking at. But if you're switched off because you're in this routine of go to the same place, be around the same people, have the same conversations, go home, watch fucking the office again. Um, that's it. But people do that. Oh, yeah. They do I, the same thing, right? And so, like, why would your brain differentiate today from next week or from two months from now? It just yeah. becomes a blur because your brain doesn't have to deal with any new information. It'll just fill in the gaps and put you on autopilot. It's incredible. Yeah. Whereas if I'm chasing things that make me uncomfortable and chasing things that push my edge, you know, I'm very present. And when I'm very present, that time seems to slow down, whether that's like spending eight weeks in a straight leg brace with not being able to walk after a surgery. Yeah, I don't have anything to tell you that happened great there other than I sat on the couch and ate opiates and played video games. Probably and don't it, remember a whole lot of that either. <laughs> no, it vanished. It's eight weeks of my life that disappeared into a, I sat on the couch and didn't do anything. Whereas through being able to travel and immerse myself in new experiences and the more intense, the better, the more switched on I am, the more uncomfortable I become because I'm having to figure out new problems. Yeah. I have to figure out, oh shit, how do we get from this point to this point? You know, I would go lucky enough when I was traveling in the Highland Games to spend, you know, a week in Scotland or a week in Iceland competing. And I have nothing but stories and memories to tell you, right? Because yeah, it's, it's awesome. new. And so that time expands in how I think about it. Mm -hmm. So that, that slows things down because I'm not in routine. And so the more time that I can spend in that zone of try a new thing and have some new experiences, be really uncomfortable, and then come back and regroup and integrate what I found important to continue to go forward with, gave me direction and it gave me that back that sense of purpose instead of that stuck trapped feeling of life that i just could see unfolding week after week and doing the same thing and going to the same place for vacation every year and and being around the exact same people and doing the same shit man drinking and complaining Right. Yeah. That's what it becomes, right? You sit in front of the news and watch the weather or whatever and say, well, look at how bad the world is. <laughs> And I, that is totally not for me. Like my parents are just for context. My parents are super Midwest. So the idea of traveling and a lot of the, the going beyond the borders of your, of where you, you've lived most of your life is very foreign to them or like mm -hmm. embracing. I don't even know if it's discomfort per se. They're just cool with where they're at. If that makes sense. Like they have so deep roots. Let's, let's, let's dissect that a little bit. Yeah. Right. That. You know, my parents, uh, you know, my father passed away at 62, was born in probably the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I really don't know what year he was born. Died at 62 in 2014. Someone else can do that math. Um, and my mom is 70 as of this year, right? And so they were raised by a generation that actually dealt with scarcity. Mm -hmm. so if we go back to kind of this World War II generation, this, you know, Korean War, this post-World War II birth, you know, people that were in their high school whenever World War II happened, the best thing you could ever have in life was comfort. The best thing you could ever have in life is a refrigerator full of food. The best thing you could have in life is a job that you don't have to worry about money. And our parents got it. 
through that time. And so that's what got passed on to us as the biggest values possible. But as that shifted away from us needing to find that comfort, and because most of us now have it, we don't know what to do. Yeah. Right. And it's not their fault that they lived into those expectations. It was built on the time that they were in. But yeah. the rules change generation to generation. And the truth is a lot of people are lost, young men, young women. Oh, they're yeah. so lost and so confused about finding that direction and finding that purpose and realizing like where that real fire and purpose for their life lies because they're following the expectations of being told what was going to make them happy. It's so funny. Like I remember we, like as I was leaving high school, one of my professors, like it was like right around the 08 crisis. He's like, well, guys, as soon as you guys get done with college, everything will be great again. <laughs> I've just been like, as a millennial, it's just been the wildest of roller coasters to be on this ride. And Are you technically a millennial? Yeah, I'm technically a millennial. I was I think born I'm in, like elder. I was born in 93. Yeah, so. I'm, a, I'm a 83, so I believe I'm like as right old yeah, a millennial. I'm right at the very I'm, edge I'm as old as we're allowed to be and still be a millennial. <laughs> yeah. But like, it's been the wildest ride to just be like on almost the like front seat of this stuff because like i remember when cell phones and technology were not a thing and you mm. still had to awkwardly call your friend's house or whoever you're talking to and their parents answer the phone you're like i want to talk to my friend yeah please and your voice is cracking <laughs> <laughs> like it's just the strangest thing to just see all the changes that have gone around and like part of the reason i even do this is because i'm like all these podcasters all these thinkers like you don't see the buildup, right? Like you see their their magnum opus or like the thing they're known for today, like the Zuckerbergs or the Elon Musks of the world. Like you don't see them in their 20-somethings where they were so gung-ho about the thing they thought they could achieve, but they were still that 20-something-year-old who didn't know what the fuck they were actually doing, but yet it worked out. And so and you don't a, get a that big story. big away from that too, right, is what you don't see is that they also had to escape that gravity of the people they're around not understanding why they care about this. Yes. And those other people that at that age, with scarcity being such a built-in thing that most of us came with, of being competitive and that you've got to be the best because that's the opportunity and someone else will take it if you don't, when the truth is none of that's real. Like there's an infinite amount of abundance that we can all have out there. There's yeah. not some amount of podcasts that keep you from being a podcaster. Is it harder now to become a famous podcaster? Yeah, it's more competitive. But that doesn't stop the barrier of entry from you deciding to be a podcaster. Right. Right. You can do it. But realizing those people had to push through that level of no one understanding is, is a really important part of understanding what's going to make you great. Yeah. Like to me, it's always been like this striving to, to find, like you said earlier, it was like the finding your edge. Like, especially like it was weird. Cause like, like what you're saying with like the stasis of like time just slips by. If you get stuck in a routine, I really felt that when, when the pandemic hit too, like life all of a sudden shrank effectively where you couldn't really go do things. You didn't really have people around, or at least like for me, I had a lot of friends that moved away. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there wasn't really a social outlet to be like, hey, let's go meet up, even if it's just at the park or whatever like nope. that. Um, and so um, like my way to like get rid of the Groundhog Day feeling was like, I'm going to get on my bike while the weather's nice, or I'm going to run, and I'm going to just kind of pick a random path. And like, all I got to do is just make it back home. That's it, and, right? And, and, like, and like, that was, or didn't, don't get hit by a car, but like, that's kind of part of the challenge is like playing Frogger with... <laughs> <laughs> Playing Frogger with reality, but um, <laughs> mm. the the it really made it like more approachable for me to be able to like kind of keep the 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 gravity well at bay during that period of time, and then it's like for a little while I was able to ride like a wave of it and be like, oh, I'm gonna still keep doing podcasts, but then it's like the longer it went on, like it was like the balloon was deflating and like your your resistance to it was starting to fade, and then like right around the end of 2022. I just kind of had this like new like headspace kind of like I shook off the rust effectively mentally of being able to like just take risks again. Like if I don't, like if you want to change something, the only thing you can do is ask. Like if you want to be a podcaster, what's this thing you need to do to be a podcaster? Well, you need to ask guests to be on your podcast. 
and you're either going to get a no or you're not going to get a response and they or they say yes. Like those are your three options and it's like you just have to be okay with eating sh a lot of shit. <laughs> Look, that's one of the great sales of doing one of the great joys of doing sales, right? Is that no becomes not really a big deal. Yeah. Um I'm glad I got to learn that. No just means not right now. And yeah, totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> you know, also like harboring any bitterness between like, well, no one will be on my show. No, it's not their dream. This is your dream. Yo, know, start recording them solo. I don't care. Be consistent. Learn how to do it. Right. Like that's that leaning in and, and, and deciding that, you know, as far as risk goes, man, I, I've eliminated a lot of my hang up toward it because whether I want to live this life taking risk and challenging myself to see really and maximize what am I capable of as a human? What can I build? What type of universe can I create? What life can I build based on my wants, my desires, my direction? And so if I don't, I end up dead, right? Yeah. Because that's what time does. Long enough timeline, survival rate of this whole thing zero. Yeah. Or I can pursue all those things and I still end up dead. So where's the risk? Is the risk my level of what uncomfortability I can stomach? Because man, I can manage that. You know, I'm doing it because conversations with people who also give a shit refill my bucket. And if I don't have those people in my immediate circle, welcome internet. Because there's a <laughs> bunch of us out here. I mean, that's how I found you. It's just, it's just the craziest thing ever. Like that modern technology can find the, you know, the esoteric people who are just like, well, let's, let's get inside the mind and figure out how this thing works and what, like, what can we do to achieve whatever the thing you're trying to achieve is? And it's like, oh, wait, high performance or whatever you want to call it looks the same. It's just, you just change the domain. Like one of the things I always think about when it comes to like athletes or business people, it's like, like Michael Jordan's of the world. He just happened to find basketball and that was his thing that he's really, really passionate about. But he would have, if he was a business person or whatever, like he would have found another domain and been just as good. It, like, yeah, maybe. Just some, like, I mean, do I not, think he's the Michael Jordan of everything he tries to do? Probably not. You know, in the same way, you know, becoming a world champion and then that being taken from me. I, again, I'm an, I'm an idiot guy from Louisiana, <laughs> from a small town. Mm -hmm. who somehow became best in the world at a 700-year-old sport from Scotland. Like, there's no direct <laughs> path there, right? Like, I did some searching to find that thing. I kept trying things and trying things, and eventually one clicked. Who told there's you about it? Like, how, like, where did you hear about that? Like, because it's because it, obviously you have to go to Scotland to, to do this stuff, so it's not no, like... That's not true. There's, oh, there's no? plenty of competitions oh. around the U.S. Oh, okay. But we're also see. talking about, like, 2008, right? So, like, we're different internet then. Yeah, as far as groups and figuring out all this type of stuff goes, but it was still enough to start finding people that were doing strongman. So like, okay, we'll try that. Found people gotcha. doing weightlifting. So okay, we'll do that. Um, as a collegiate thrower, uh, and me personally, um, I had a coach and knew some other people who had done Highland Games stuff. But it's one of those like, oh, that looks really fun. I'd love to try that one day. And then at some point, I found one. Wow. Like, oh, whoa, they're having an amateur competition and blah, blah, blah. Let's go. Yeah. Instead of, well, I don't know how to train for it. I don't know what the events are. I don't know any of this. Like, go and just suck. <laughs> like, you're only allowed to be shitty at a thing for so long. Yeah. And people try to skip that step. And that step's really important. Like, just go be bad at it and admit you're bad at it and learn. I think people put too much weight into talent because everything, like, Especially within like the like eighties and nineties era, it was like, oh, they're really talented in whatever. It could be, usually instruments and sports was like the big thing back mm -hmm. then. But it was like, like I, like I've never really felt like I'm talented at anything. It's just like I, there's certain things that click, but it's a lot of it's just you just grind harder than anybody else. Like if you put more reps on, like I always go back to weightlifting and like the gym. But it's like the more reps you do, the better you get at the thing. It's like, if you want to be better at running, well, just run a whole lot and see what happens. And then just track, your pace, and track your pace and see if, you know, are you getting faster? Okay, if you're not getting faster, maybe you should try a little bit harder on your run. Like, 
Well, the problem becomes the expectation, right? Is that people go in with this expectation. Luckily for me, as I had won a world championship and become best in the world at a thing twice, chances are I'm not going to find a second thing Mm -hmm. that I'm best in the world at. Most people don't find one. I'm probably not going to find two, which then lowers a lot of the expectation of what I want to get out of this. And I've decided what I'm trying to get out of this is my pursuit. What can I learn? What can I steal from this new activity that is important for the other things that I'm going to run into later? Instead of, well, I'm going to get into running and that means this, and then I'll be a runner. Like, I don't want to be a runner, but can I run? Yeah. You know, in the same way, like I got to compete as a Highland Games athlete, but doing my walking around talking about being a world champion, I'm not. It's a thing I did. It's not who I am. Yeah. You know, who that, I am is someone that's obsessed with progress. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of the things I remember talking, I was talking to a psychologist, I think they, they called it identity foreclosure is the, is like one of the hardest things, especially for, for like Olympians and high level athletes is because they can never step outside of the identity of being that Olympian, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm a gold medalist, whatever. And it's like, well, I mean, sorry to say, but you're like being an athlete at a high level has an expiration date or I mean, many things have an expiration date, kind of what we talked about earlier with, with choosing to, to leave different friend groups or college ending, high school ending, things like that. It's a similar thing, but it's like, you have to be able to set yourself up for what's the next thing. And I actually tried to try to do that for myself when I was finishing college. I was like, well, I'm about to have this degree, but this doesn't end because I'm not in school anymore. Like this learning and growing and figuring out what I don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm doing this podcasting thing already. So let's just, this will just be more effort to put into that because I mean, totally honest, I really didn't see there was a lot of value for me to go to master's and PhD program. Just the type of person that I was. And that I wasn't going to be able to pull that off. I got out of college with a general studies degree. I basically <laughs> went to LSU long enough that they were like, you're good, man. Best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's like, I just don't think certain, like, unless you want to do something that requires you to be that, like, at the cutting edge of academia, fine. Like, lawyer, doctor, psychologist, stuff like that. I'm not trying to say anything about that. But what I'm saying is, like, you need to be able to create your own, you know, real life master's program or PhD program, however you see it. Because, I mean, let's be honest, school didn't really teach it. It teaches you a lot, but it, there's a lot of, Like, it doesn't last for very long once you get out of (laughs) Right, 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 right. No, it doesn't last for very long at all. The the half-life of that knowledge is very limited. (laughs) That is for sure. (laughs) And to me, it was like, okay, so what are the things that nobody teaches you about life? And, or at least you don't learn in a book. And how do you get that knowledge? And a lot of it is really just having conversations with people who've lived more life than you. And being a young person. Well, that's I'm why like, we go into books. That's why we do yeah. that, right? Like is to get someone else's experience because outside of an experience, it's an opinion. And I don't want to have a bunch of opinions on things. Another piece of awareness that's deeper down in that is realizing my opinion doesn't have to be true to you mm. because they're different, right? And so my opinion is only true to me. Because our perspectives are different, our experiences are different, and everything that got us there is different. But that doesn't make it not real for me. You know, one of the, I I noticed that years ago as people would tell stories that like I was involved with, Mm -hmm. and I'd be like, oh man, they, that's not how it went. And they, they're embellishing this, or they're talking about this and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, why didn't they fucking tell the story the way it is? And the older I've gotten and realized now that Look, as, as we know that eyewitness testimony isn't the most accurate in court, then who's to say they're lying? That is what they remember. That is their perception of that event. That is what they saw. And that doesn't invalidate what my perception of it was. But instead, we're trying to argue about an ethereal point. And instead, just listening to the experience and what they got out of it, instead of me trying to identify and say, well, that's not what happened. Yeah. That's an interesting one because, yeah, it's like how do people internalize the the, the experiences in their life, right? In, in some sense, it's like, okay, so what are the, like, 
you you can have an event play out and it's like okay so how do you frame that and i think it's one of those important things is because you can frame it in a negative way like find a reason to think why your life is horrible or you could change it and be like okay so how do i learn from this like what did i do wrong or like stop beating yourself up over these things because it's like you can't change it like it already happened right so it's like why I remember I, when I was younger, I would do this a lot. Like being, I was really cerebral and really into books and all that kind of stuff. So I would be like, I don't know how to connect with people because I just think about stuff more and I don't know how to articulate these ideas because I just don't have the development of my brain to be able to, mm -hmm. to communicate effectively, realistically. And I would just be like, well, I'm just different than everyone else. I don't belong. I'm an outcast. I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and escape into books and escape into video games. And like live the life and be like, well, at least in video games or in books, I can live the life of somebody else who's, who's better than me. <laughs> and it's, I'm laughing because I've done so much of my own, own unpacking of my bullshit that I, it, I don't even feel like that person anymore. I'm well, totally that person didn't person. decide to make a podcast and put it out. Oh, they you know what not. I mean? So like, that's already such a step above, dude. The fact that you're already leaning into that discomfort and that you're leaning into trying new things and doing it for you. Mm hmm while providing value to other people is a huge step. But that, that shut-in becomes so easy for people to feel alienated and feel lost. And especially with the expectations that we see from social media of mm -hmm. what life should be and what happiness should be. And while I'm not finding that, I guess that's a fantasy. That the, rea the reality is, is those people already had it from jump. They're already special. They're different. They're gifted. They had all these doors opened. And the more that I was able to drop that, you know, that, that barrier that I had about those people's existence in life and me making assumptions about what that story was, the more that I could see there's a path Yeah. that all these people had picked a path and have committed to it. And like, if, you know, one of the guys I talked to a couple of weeks ago is getting ready to do like a solo crossing of Antarctica, like fully oh, self-supported, wow. right? So like he's talking about like a hundred days and like dragging a 400 pound sled and doing all this. And so in the meantime, if you look at like, what does it require for me to be able to accomplish that? Then those are the skills I need to start acquiring now to be that guy. But you get to change your avatar all the time. <laughs> You can change your exposure and change who you are simply from consistent effort today, right? Like the little one degree shifts every single day are the ones that add up over time. People far, far underestimate what they can get done in 10 years and drastically overestimate what they'll accomplish in a year. Yeah, I to totally agree with that. I mean, as of actually two days from now i'll be starting five years of doing this experiment that is feeding curiosity so it, it's been a long road and i mean i started while i was in college and still working full-time and i'm here i am still doing it now and it's evolved and it's changed but it's like the amount of skills that i've learned just by committing to it mm -hmm. it's not even the podcasting side like i've learned you know photoshop i've learned graphic design thumbnails photo photograph like photography for doing headshots if i need to or even just using like whatever I can pull from to find good images for things or just creating show notes. It's just like, okay, you just said yes to this thing. Now you have to figure out how to make the pie, right? <laughs> well, I mean, and look at what opportunities you're exposing yourself because you've decided to stick with this. Because you're sticking with this, you and I get to have this conversation. Let's just use this simple example. Right. Versus you that decided not to DM me, right? You now have this opportunity that we get this one-on-one -on -one conversation you still get all the benefit while you're trying to do stuff for an audience and, and make that too, but you're, you're absorbing it. And what happens after this podcast, right, is really up to you. Now, whether this relationship maintains and say, say you're so driven, you're so uplifted by this, you decide to join my mentorship group, blah, 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 and start working together. And you and I build a relationship to then we meet in person. And from there, we realize we actually vibe. And then at some point we work together doing a thing. But that doesn't happen without you sending that DM. Take but there's no <laughs> rules that there's no rules that five years from now you and I aren't best friends. But I can tell you how we avoid that. That's it. <laughs> That's it, right? 
Now, is there any promise of that? Of course there's not. But that doesn't mean it isn't possible. Like that's, you know, my mentors I found, man, Jim Windler, uh, Kelly Starrett, Aubrey, Mar uh, all these guys were guys that I got lucky enough to meet once. Being someone they want to talk to a second time is tricky. Right. <laughs> but really what that requires is you being able to show up. Right. You being able to provide value because you're interested in what they're doing and trying to learn as much from them. And you know that even simply being in their orbit changes that. Right. And so like that's us having the open gym here on Sundays and allowing people to come in. That's us. We've had so many people that just started attending this free open gym. We don't even have a workout planned or anything. It's just I open the doors on Sunday from 10 to 2. If anyone wants to come in and you're interested in breath work, you want to train, you want to talk about stuff, you want to get in the sauna, want to try cold and see all these other things, the doors are open. But that's led to friendships. That's led to yeah. me having the other member coaches in my group. That's me watching people switch on in that moment and realize what they're capable of too. Starting businesses and starting to grow and starting a podcast. Instead of talking about what they could do one day, they're now saying what they will do. <laughs> yep. And totally, I like two things. The building a community, I think that is like some of the dopest things we could do right now because there's so, and especially a physical community, being able to just open the doors and be like, hey, people mm -hmm. who want to do this thing, who think like this, you know, here it is. Here's your open invitation, literally, right? <laughs> yeah, into two on Sundays, man, here in St. Louis. If like, anyone's interested, doors are open. I mean, that's really awesome to just hear that just because it's like, there's so many places these days that people are like, well, I don't have people around anymore. And it's like, clearly, well, how else do you put that to the test and do something like that? Well, um, are you looking for those people or are you waiting for them to find you? Because that is the, goal that's the key. Goal oriented people who are high performers that you want to be surrounded with have their own dreams and mission. I'm not going to have time for us to go catch dinner four nights a week. That's, that's, that's not it. I also want to be surrounded by people as stoked on their thing as I am mine. And like, that's the fire I want to pass on. I want to know whenever you come in and you talk to me about like, Hey man, we did this and now it's burned into this and it's grown into this and it's grown into this. I want to share that stoke with you because I know how much is out there and available for everyone to have. That's honestly why I, I love this stuff too, because it's like the. I might not be into the thing you're into, but it's like, if I hear the passion and see that fire behind your eyes about the thing you care about, like really love, it's like, oh damn, well, I'm going to go work really hard on the thing that I'm going to like, <laughs> I'm going to go edit a podcast real quick and get it done faster than, <laughs> than I could have before. Or as uh, right now I'm also training for the Chicago marathon. So right on. So, and it's like been the craziest week ever, or not really week, like last two months, I, January, I broke a hundred miles in one month, which I have never done more than probably 20 in a month. <laughs> so it's. I was trying to think. So like I had after my knee replacement and yeah. trying to reinvent and figure everything out and kind of getting settled in St. Louis after detonating an old life. Yep. Uh, the first thing I decided to pursue was endurance. Uh, and we, we put together a short film called Fragile. It's on my YouTube channel. Oh, cool. Uh, with me and my creative partner, Brant. And we told that story. Like I went from, I'm not a runner. I'm a. Right. 30 at that time, I'm a 37 year old guy with a fake knee and a, mm -hmm. and a shitty hip. Like I'm never going to be a good runner, mm -hmm. much less best in the world at it. Right? Like there's a 0% chance, <laughs> but that's not the goal. The goal was to see how much I could improve and how much I could learn from it. than where I was currently at 12 weeks of just considering to show up and add a little bit more linear progression to where I'm pushing myself every week. I was able to go take on a 30 kilometer ultra race wow. uh, in Bryce Canyon that had 4,000 feet of elevation. And my only goal for it was I want to enjoy my time doing it. I want to be in shape enough and have enough knowledge of how to properly fuel myself that it isn't a death march, that I'm not spending the whole time cramping and dying and just wanting out. And everything hurts. <laughs> you know, I want yeah. the skill set from it. It's not crossing the finish line. I mean, I, it's a funny part of the documentary, but I crossed the finish line and this lady asked me, she's like, oh, do you want a trophy? And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> like, I don't care. I don't, I'm not into any of that. You're like, I don't need the participation award. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't have any world championship trophies around. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, 
I love that for one thing. I'm going to have to definitely go watch that because for me, it's like that's part of the reason why I took this on. My buddy who asked me if I wanted to do it this year, it was like early December, like right around Thanksgiving maybe. And he's just like, hey, he's done the marathon like two or three times already. And I'm like, guy's a natural athlete type of dude. And I'm like, I think I could do it. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to go all you in. People on The Biggest Loser go do a marathon. Yeah. And, and it's like, part of it too is like, it's like proving that younger version of myself wrong is what it really, really what it came down to is like that younger version of me didn't see themselves a runner. I probably barely, I don't even think I ever ran like sub 10 minute mile back in, in high I school know. kind of thing. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to just do this thing. And it's not that I'm going to do it, but I'm going to like just kill my, not really kill myself, but I'm just going to be so overly prepared that running the marathon is going to be easy in comparison to all the training I'm doing to forge myself into a person that can do this thing. And I'm yep. like, so I'm, I'm using whoop as like my training yeah. coach for this thing. And I, I've been basically spending the last nine years with podcasts and doing my own podcasts and just learning about this stuff. I'm like, all right, well, time to put this all to the test. Here's the rubber beats the road. Can you, do you have the nuts and bolts of this mindset thing to perform at a level that you didn't think was possible? And it's like, even if I don't, like I blow up at the marathon or something or I have an injury, I've already accomplished something that I didn't think I could do, which was run, run a hundred miles in a month, let alone 26 at one time. And then it's just been like, by taking on that challenge, it like makes all the rest of like the bullshit in life feel like nothing. Cause like, I'm going to go run outside for five, six miles a night. And then, or last week it was like two of the coldest days here in the suburbs of Chicago. It's like negative three and negative seven. And I was like, well, I told myself I was going to break 100 miles ba based on the app, so I have to go run outside. Doesn't matter how cold it is. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a really big part that people bail on. And, and it's that huge lesson of that fear and the scarcity and expectations that keep us from taking action is that the second that I set my alarm, right, that like I'm going to get up <clears throat> I'll be up at five and get this thing done that's important to me. Every time I hit that snooze, I broke a promise to me and said that that was okay. So that's a boundary to set. So why am I going to be confident? Why am I going to have trust when I say we're doing a thing? Like how do I get my body and brain on board at the same time if we don't believe that we'll actually show up for it? And so that's the consistent piece every day that's simply showing up and doing the best you can that day with the options you have. So even if it's too cold, even if it's just this, cool, we'll be on the treadmill today. Cool, I yeah. can walk back and forth in this place. How do I get it done with what I've got? And still being able to keep that truth to yourself and being able to hold yourself accountable. Yeah. Because if you're waiting for someone else to hold you accountable to your dreams, they're never going to give a shit. Your dreams have to matter to you more than they matter to anyone else. In fact, if you let someone care about your dreams more than you do, you'll never get there. That's one of the rules. And in my coaching and with my mentorship, like that's one of the first rules is like, I'll never fucking care about your dreams more than you do. Ever. You have to care. You have to care way more than I do because I care about mine. I'll do this shit in a vacuum with no one else watching forever because it matters to me. Yeah. And as soon as you unlock that, the rest of the abundance and people following get interested because that's what's special. Grinding when nobody else is looking. I, I don't know. It's like one of those things that I've been really enjoying about this process of becoming a runner or just a person who's commits to running. I've just been like, yeah, I'm this crazy person who's out here in, you know, Chicago winter. <laughs> And there's nobody else around. <laughs> and it's, it's just been like this. It's almost cathartic. It's like it becomes like a meditation of things. Well, you're like, separating yourself. Right? You're separating yeah. yourself from a group of average that isn't willing to do that. And the life that you want doesn't fit into the same thing that those people are getting. You have to take different actions. Right? If the life you want doesn't look like what you're currently doing, all of your actions have to change to get you there. Yeah. But people have put such hangups about that. I'm like, well, I don't have anyone to run with. So what? You got feet? <laughs> Honestly, the you know, my, fucking podcast on. Yeah, that's my favorite thing to do is I put out a podcast. Honestly, David Goggins' new book has been my uh, running buddy. Good one. I want to run with, man. That's I love David Goggins. 
that guy speaks to my soul. <laughs> yeah. Just because it's like, I think people misconstrue certain things about like people who are so driven. It's like they think about it as in it, it, they're saying something about you, the listener, or the other people who are the the lazy person or whatever. And it's it's not about doing the crazy, ridiculous thing like running outside in the cold, per se. Like there's a version of you that could do that. I'm not going to say that's not possible, but what I do it's think totally though, possible. What I do think though is there's a version of you that wants to like there's some tiny portion of you that could be so fired up about something that it, they'll run through a brick wall to achieve it. And it's just your job to find it. And most people fall short of finding, like, they're just like, hey, I'm tired. And it's like, well, it's like the motivation and discipline, you know what I mean? Like, like the difference between motivation and discipline is, it's like motivation lasts for, I don't know, maybe a week or whatever. And then you get tired and then your routine falls apart or whatever. It's like, or someone cancels on you. It's like, all right, well, now it's time to kick discipline into high gear. Yo, and especially stop that shit of beating yourself up. Yes. Right? That if, if you're not familiar with the book, uh, The Four Agreements, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the best things that you can add to your life as far as awareness and personal development. It's a pretty simple book. I, I revisit it at least once a year, and I dive into it really deep. I'm definitely going to have to buy that one. I've heard it talked about a lot, but it's just one of those books that I just haven't gotten to. For so whatever it's really reason. simple. The four agreements are uh, always do your best, don't make assumptions, be impeccable with your word, and don't take things personally. And it applies hmm. to such depth. Man, that's... When people don't get your pursuit, it's not personal. It's not an attack. It isn't their pursuit. It's yours. Don't make an assumption that when I do this, I'm going to get X. Go find out. Go find out what you get from doing the thing and quit trying to have some one point of expectation that's built on fairy tale bullshit about where this is going to get you. It's not how it works. Yeah. Just lean into the process and learn. Like there, there's not any books written about the view from Everest because no one cares. That's a photograph. Everyone wants to know about the fight. Sure. Everyone wants to know about the struggle, what you overcame, what you learned. All that. Yeah. I, it's, it's so true, right? Like nobody, and nobody wants the person with the silver spoon in their mouth who didn't have to struggle and, right? Like everyone would rather hear the story about the underdog, the person who had to fight for the accomplishments and all the setbacks and, right? Like, it, like if your story was so different where you just like, hey, I decided to walk away from Highland Sports, you know, like, and you didn't have an injury that made you rethink, like, what no, you it changed everything. Your it, was a, right. it was a gift. And look, that's the framing of that perspective. Either that can be the worst thing that's ever fucking happened to me, or it's now been the thing that's propelled the rest of me forward. But that's up to me. That's simply based on my perception of that event and what I choose to do with following it. And that's under my control. The other things that are out of my control is how my knee feels some days. The things that are out of my control is that there was a cost to being the best in the world at a thing. Like, we can stop pretending chasing greatness is healthy. It isn't. <laughs> so no. what? I mean, it's, I've like I always hear people talk about like finding balance or like work life balance in your life, and I think it's so funny because I'm like, if you really are all in about something in your life, there is no such thing as balance. Like you're the most unbalanced per person in the world. <laughs> yeah. So where I find that balance is trying to be present in whatever the thing I'm doing and being yeah. intentional with that time. If I'm training, I want to be intentional with that time. If I'm podcasting today, I want to be intentional with that time. If I'm sitting on the couch hanging out with my chick because the day's done and we get a chance to connect, I want to be intentional with that time. But that's where I want to be all in on whatever the thing is I'm doing. I'm not waiting for the next thing to come. It's amazing. I totally, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Like that, that's one of the things like being present, you know, disconnecting from the to-do list and just being like, all right. This is what you're doing for whatever period of time and just no distraction, right? Sink into that moment because, I mean, that's all we have, right? It's, it's a string of moments and then hopefully you were there to connect with as many people at the end of the day. And, you know, it's your, the lives of those you care about around you are better having had those moments, right? That's like, it. That's the, that's the simplest way to put it, right? Yep. Well, we're right about at the end point here. I, I mean, we just hit the gas and just ran with it, but 
One of the last questions I really like to ask people, I mean, I feel like we've kind of covered it, like beat it to death, but it's for smart driven people or even people who are just looking to pivot in their life. What advice do you have to give for someone who might just be entering the real world or looking to change? The first thing I need that person to do is actually believe they can. Because otherwise you're just going to keep this barrier up of it not being there. Right. Like I remember being in the dark and I remember when I was hurt and being really scared about all of that and what my future looked like. And I was starting to see more self-help shit and all this mm -hmm. other stuff start coming out. And I thought all of it was such bullshit. I thought <laughs> all of it was such a lie. The fuck do these people know? Right. And then I remember at some moment saying, maybe don't have that opinion until you read one self-help book. Right. Because now I've based all this on. Oh, fucking Tony Robbins, right? Like, fuck, right. blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I'm so turned off by that. This guy yelling at this audience of people because it's, it's, evangel it's evangelical. Right? Yeah. It's the same thing. And the older I've gotten, I get it. And the older I've now opened myself up to new experiences and things that I would have blocked myself off from, from previous expectations or the place I grew up in or what the beliefs were in that system or that this is dumb or that's lame or any of this other shit, I was wrong. You know, I want to find where I'm wrong. I don't want to prove anyone else wrong in holding the line. I want to prove me right. I know that I'm great. You hear me? Like I fucking know <laughs> that I'm great. And I want other people to feel that. And that doesn't have anything to do with your bank account. It doesn't have anything to do with the job you have, the status you have. That energy is still there and you can change it. We have nothing but an infinite number of stories to hear people do impossible shit. And I don't know how many times you need to hear the impossible story happen for it to click to you that you can deserve whatever life it is you're willing to die for. But that's the way it works. And so... For those out there listening that are scared and feel trapped and spent that time building a successful living, but aren't living a life, I want to help. You know, I want to share my resources. I want to share everything I learned over the last 10 years of me traveling around the world and being around coaches and mentors and seeing people move people, seeing people absolutely change their life. Those people changed my life. So I know it's real. And I know once I started embodying that full abundance in my life, everything changed. I started making more money. I started having better relationships with the people around me. I was less caught up in bullshit because I can see it. And I'm less tolerant of it. And I love getting to see that in people. And that's what not dead yet means is that the life in front of me is so much more important than the years I've already spent. I'm not obligated to continue on a path just because I've done it. I have the ability to change. I have the ability to shift. Now, with that said, no one can change you. And I can't change anyone. But if you want to change and you believe you can change, I can teach you some tools that'll get you out of that. I can teach you some awareness tools that get you thinking different. And the more we manage your perspectives, we change your reality. And when your reality changes, you realize you're in control of all of it. You can fucking do anything. And that's what getting to work with people with Not Dead Yet Life's been about. Well, I love it. I don't want to spend too much more time wrapping this up. So where can people connect with you? And I'm sure I'll have all yeah, this so in the show notes. Matthew P. Vincent on Instagram is a great way. Send me a direct message. It's really easy for me to connect as you know. Yep. I mean, I'm not hard to get in touch with. Nope, not at all. <laughs> um, our brand is Not Dead Yet. That's at notdeadyet.com. And my mentorship, we're hosting retreats. I have a hard reset men's retreat coming up in March. Um, that man, if you're trapped in that spot, I can help you in that 72 hour intensive weekend. Let go of all the stuff that you've been dragging with you that's keeping you from becoming your best you. We can pinpoint it, we can find it, and we can let go of it and then provide you with the tools and a plan of action of how to attack the life you really want. But if you don't get to set the sights on where you want to go, I can't point you in a direction. I can't tell you what the next step is. I can't tell you what all those things are. But once we determine that, 
we can fix it. And all of that is at ndylife.com. Uh, we have another retreat that just opened up in October. And I think that those signups are just starting to begin. And myself and Bonnie and one of our close friends, Jen Wiederstrom, have decided to come together. And we're hosting a big event down in Austin at cool. the end of April. That's April, like, uh, April 28th through May 1st. And it's another 72-hour intensive thing. And we're bringing in speakers like Rob and Daniel and Bailey and Justin Wren and Kyle Kingsbury oh, and cool. Kelly Sturette. Mm -hmm. And I want to condense all of these people that helped me break that gravity of where I was to become who I wanted into one place and fucking light your fire that weekend. And getting a chance to do that and watch people switch on is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I watch people come into those weekends, dude, with such distress and such feeling of lost and depressed and fear and scared. And they leave and they'll never feel that again. That's it. You'll never, ever have to deal with that feeling again. Because you have a plan. We have tools. We know a direction and we've let go a lot of the expectations that have been holding us back and our own set limitations of even what we think we're capable of. And so that's where it all is, man. Yeah, man. I Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I'll definitely be in touch. That's for sure. Yeah, um, dude, please. I mean, if you're up in Chicago, we're not that far. Yeah, not at all. Thank you all for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really enjoyed everything Matt had to say. And as always, we barely scratched the surface. So if you are still interested, highly, highly recommend you go check out everything else Matt does because he has a lot of wisdom to share. Last but not least, though, if you've made it this far in the video, please consider hitting the like button, the subscribe button, or leaving a review on any and all of the podcast services that the, you can find our lovely podcast. And if you have any feedback, any thoughts at all, I want to get better at what I do. And that means feedback. Deed, all of it. Good, bad, ugly, I don't care. And this is an entirely self-funded product, so consider supporting our content over on Patreon, because that means I can get better guests, do but more, and just overall level up what I do here. And that's the name of the game. Just level up forever and ever. Until it's... <laughs> until I'm not able to do that anymore, meaning I'm dead. So, the, I only said that because of the kind of conversation we had. <laughs> but anyways, thank you all for listening and or watching one more time. And I will see you all in the next episode.